Hi, this is Dylan Brogan. Before we get to today's conversation, CityCast is serving our listeners to help us make CityCast Madison a better, more useful podcast for you. Please go to citycast.fm slash survey, and you'll be eligible to win a $250 Visa gift card. That's citycast.fm slash survey, or click the link in our show notes. Today on CityCast Madison. An unpaid bill, parking ticket, or criminal offense can spiral into a big problem, especially when you don't even know it's on your record. Unresolved legal issues can prevent people from finding housing, getting a driver's license, or landing a job. But now there's Legal Tune-Up, a mobile-friendly website that helps folks easily identify what's on their record and how to resolve the matter once and for all. Today, Bianca Martin talks to Executive Director of Lyft Wisconsin, Erica Nelson, about how it works. It's Wednesday, May 31st, and here's what Madison's talking about. Erica, hello. Hi. Nice to be here today. Yes. Let's talk about Lyft Wisconsin. So Lyft being Legal Interventions for Transforming Wisconsin and you have this Correct. website called Legal Tune Up, and it's yep. connecting folks to legal resources across the board and their records. Can you talk about how that tool works? The work of Lyft and Legal Tune Up is around helping people have greater agency to address their c- civil legal justice issues, like an expungement, like your record on CCAP, like a prior housing eviction, like a suspended driver's license from a fine or a fee. The tool is a web-based tool that allows um, individuals to uh, sort of put in their name and their birth date and um, like pull up from databases to see whether your driver's license has been suspended or whether there's something on your record that you didn't know that um, is actually preventing you from getting a job and then begin to address it through step-by-step questions and an approach that allows you to have do it yourself. Because a lot of it is that Uh, Low-income folks in particular don't have access to an attorney or to civil legal aid. And this is a way to create greater access for folks. Absolutely. And I tried it out and it seems pretty straightforward. you did? Yeah, I did. I did. (laughs) It seems pretty straightforward. So it sounds like it's designed for individuals to be able to access their own records really easily, um, if I'm hearing that correctly. Or is it with... Yeah. Yeah. So that's great uh, that you check out. It's designed both for individuals and for um, service providers to assist people in overcoming some of these challenges. Yeah. And and so I saw it shows your court criminal records, court eviction records, your arrests. And these are all things, like you said, could be accessed from landlords or employers. Um, Why is it so hard for individuals to really know what's going on and and be able to have agency without a tool like this before this tool was, was here? Well, I think, one, for a lot of us, it's intimidating, it's overwhelming, it's complicated. There's a lot of forms, there's a lot of rules, there's complicated chronology. And, you know, in particular for uh, folks of color, you know, the legal system hasn't been a champion. And there's a lot of uh, mistrust and um, with the legal system. So I think that a tool like Legal Tune-Up is necessary because the We want to give folks access to justice, and you shouldn't just have access to justice if you can afford it. And these systems that are in play are very complicated and often need someone who's familiar with them and know how they operate. They're separate. You know, so there's different administrations that are administrating your driver's license, looking at child support. Uh, The criminal justice system is an entirely different administrative system. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're very hard to navigate. Yeah. And and you pointed out there aren't that many lawyers in terms of how many folks can even afford a lawyer is is pretty low. Yeah. I mean, there are not enough civil legal Uh, aid civil justice lawyers out there. Um, And the state of Wisconsin 
many folks may or may not know, is sort of in this crisis of legal need for legal um, help, whether that's on the criminal side or on the civil uh, side. So if you're in a rural place in the state of Wisconsin, it's actually really hard to get an attorney. And then the volume of folks that need attorneys is really high. I think um, the statistic for the state is that about 750,000 Wisconsinites face a legal civil legal issue on an annual basis, more than half a million of those folks will not have that issue resolved within the year because it's overwhelming, because it's complicated, because they may not even know they have it, for one, and then it's really hard to access um, assistance with it. I want to dig in a little bit about the fact that folks might not even know they have a record. I am Mm -hmm. new to the CCAP database or the Wisconsin Circuit Court records. I haven't had to engage with it, luckily, but um, many folks have. And maybe folks that they don't even know that they have a record in there. Can you unpack that for us a little bit? Well, I think with, you know, you may have encountered something in law enforcement that you thought was resolved and in fact just stays on the the, uh, CCAP court records database, right? So um, you can go through the process of having it removed from the database. And therefore, it is not something that's publicly available to a prospective employer or to a landlord. How easy is that to do? Um, I mean, it depends on what on the circumstances around the issue. Certain things cannot just be done on your own and expunged, hence why, or gotten um, removed, hence why you may need a lawyer, depending on the set of circumstances. Yeah. And and it's really it's really true that our records follow us everywhere. And Mm -hmm. I, I would would you be able to give us an example? One of the core hopes and and, um, goals of Lyft Wisconsin is to help the most vulnerable, the most marginalized individuals in our community um, have access to economic well-being, being able to get jobs, you know, not be in the revolving door of poverty. Can you give us an example of how someone gets caught up in the system? Well, a really simple example that I think we don't think about is if you've got a parking ticket and you haven't paid the parking ticket because you can't afford to pay the parking ticket, um, that builds on itself. It compounds into further fees and fines for an unpaid ticket and then late fees. And then the next thing you know, as a consequence, because you haven't paid that ticket, um, you have a suspended driver's license. And having a driver's license is one of the most key factors in being employed in Dane County. And people are then faced with the choice. Do they drive without their license and risk being pulled over and having a greater fine or fee? Or do they not drive and therefore can't get to their job, can't drop their kids at childcare? And then it it does become this revolving door of sort of um, a poverty trap where you can't, without more finances or more access to legal justice, you can't get ahead of it. So something as simple as a parking ticket Or being pulled over for not having your seatbelt on, for example, can actually turn into something that becomes a big barrier. It's so true. It's the James Baldwin quote. Anyone who has ever struggled with poverty knows how extremely expensive it is to be poor. Mm. Yeah, exactly. And and the system isn't, isn't looking at it from that perspective, right? I think that um, it actually costs us money to administer these fines and fees and then not get a return on the fine or the fee, Mm. right? We're just sort of keeping, it's a different way of keeping people down and it may not be necessary. Hey, CityCast Madison, it's Michael Zibiak. While CityCast Madison works hard every day to connect you with the stories that matter most, I'm working in the background making sure that our listeners are connecting with the best that Madison has to offer. So what does that look like? It means meeting with the people who make Madison what it is. The business owners, the stakeholders, the decision makers. The Madisonians who book the concerts you enjoy, the exhibits you can't miss, and who open the new restaurants you have to try. If this sounds like you, let me help you get your message out to the city's best audience with an ad right here on the CityCast Madison podcast. Shoot me an email at ads at citycast.fm and let's connect. I wanted to talk about the fact that you authored the Race to Equity Report 10 years ago. 
this year. Yeah. Um, groundbreaking, you know, it shook our county, it shook the state, and it showed that Wisconsin had some of the worst outcomes for black folks uh, mm-hmm. in, the whole, in the whole country. What's happened since that report came out? Obviously, this work that you're doing right now is directly addressing some of those disparities that you documented. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I think um, it's complicated to look back on the last uh, decade since the report was released. Um, And so I say that I think there's been progress made since the release. I think there's been a significant change in the approach in terms of people's thinking and outlook about racial equity. I think that we prioritized it in all levels of our work as a community. And I think we're seeing differences. I think we're seeing changes. Um, I think that uh, from the school board to educational priorities, to who we're hiring, to who's managing or running or elected, really has changed in the last decade. So that has been a positive. I also think that if you look at economically, you know, up until the pandemic, up until COVID hit, um, we were seeing progress from a data perspective and a lot of the indicators that were in the original race to equity report. However, we don't know what the impact on the community and the black community in particular has been as a consequence of COVID. And we may not know for a while. What were some of those indicators that from the report just re- remind us and for folks who you know are new to Madison and maybe haven't encountered yeah. it? I can, so there were indicators, 40 plus indicators in health, education, uh, economic well-being, criminal justice, juvenile justice, child welfare. That was the big, the large scope of it. And we were beginning to see changes around economic well-being in terms of employment, improvements in numbers of uh, Black folks that were employed and their median household income prior to uh, the pandemic and COVID-19. We are seeing a reduction in uh, juvenile justice numbers. uh, And the takeaway from that is it's possible to make progress. We are making progress on some of these numbers. And yet, We still have a lot of progress to be made with respect to those lowest income folks. And we that was where we our efforts need to be focused and targeted now is on those furthest from opportunity, those that were sort of most marginalized, most disadvantaged. Um, And that's where the I think the next emphasis should be is how do we reach those that are most economically uh, vulnerable? Mm hmm. And this is a practical tool, this website, to address that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, this is to begin to do that and to and to make it accessible and available and and, and free to uh, folks who are facing some of these, you know, initial barriers. Well, you know, hopefully someone picks up the torch and carries on the work of the race to equity report. You are in the trenches doing the work of getting, you know, the everyday practicalities of how these systems um, are disadvantaging individuals and how we can help lower <laughs> and change those racial disparities. Because mm-hmm. it, it's maybe it shouldn't have been so shocking, but I it really was um, a seismic shift in the what people were talking about here locally. Well, Erica, thank you so much for telling us about this website and tool, and we'll be sure to link to all of those resources in our show notes. Appreciate you joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. It's been it's been great. That was Erica Nelson, Executive Director of Lyft Wisconsin, with CityCast Madison host Bianca Martin. And here's what else Madison's talking about. According to WISPolitics, most University of Wisconsin campuses are facing deficits in tuition funds, totaling more than 60 million. UW System President Jay Rothman tells state lawmakers it needs more state funding to avoid staffing and programming cuts. Rothman also notes that Wisconsin's university system ranks 42nd in the nation for public funding of four-year colleges. And temperatures will be closing in on 90 degrees this week. Madison area beaches opened for the season this past weekend, but some are already closed because of toxic blue-green algae blooms. The following beaches are currently closed and are not safe to swim in. Esther Beach, Maple Bluff Beach Park, Spring Harbor, Troll Beach in Stoughton, and Verona Fireman's Park. They'll reopen once bacteria levels go down. 
You can get the latest beach conditions on Public Health's website. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Madison. I'm Dylan Brogan, in for Bianca Martin. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell someone itching for a new podcast about us? No toxic blooms here. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Stay cool. And here's what else. And here's what else. And here's what else.